Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So today morning we'll continue the discussion on the Gita applied as an overview. So I discussed the first chapter on Wednesday evening. And at the end of the first chapter, Arjun has come to a confused indecision. He at one level he makes it's confusion, but through the confusion he does indecision. I will not fight. Misrujyasasharam chapam shokasam vignamanasaha. He's put aside his bow saying, I will not fight. And he is based on his reasoning. We saw in the first chapter the whole theme is that I divide in four, four sections. First is Duryodhan's vision, then Arjun's vision, then Arjun's uh, confusion, then Arjun's reason for his confusion, concluding with Arjun's decision. So now, till now when the Bhagavad Gita Krishna has spoken only one word. Uvacha parthapa shaitan samavetan kuruniti. Just one fraction of that 25th verse, 1.25. Here in the second chapter, Krishna will speak for the first time. So can we display the chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita? The chapter second begins with Arjun being disheartened, Arjun being confused. Tam, let's recite the verse. Tam tatha krupaya vishtam. Tam tatha krupaya vishtam. Ashru purna kulekshanam. Ashru purna kulekshanam. Vishidantam idam vakyam. Vishidantam idam vakyam. Uvacha madhusudana. Uvacha madhusudana. So here, Ashru purna kulekshanam. This is a very significant point that his eyes were filled with tears. Now what is the significance of this point? That generally people don't show their emotions too much in public. Even if we are overwhelmed, we want to cry, we will be going private and cry. And especially somebody who is a warrior. Warriors are trained to conceal pain. Because pain is a sign of weakness. And say if two boxers are fighting, and say one of the boxers has got a, already a broken jaw that has been repaired, but still gets a punch, ah, the boxer winces. And immediately the opponent understands this is a point of weakness. And then the opponent will hit where it hurts. So therefore, Kshatriyas are trained to not show their emotions in public, to conceal, especially negative emotions. They may celebrate after victory, but pain they try to conceal. There are different kinds of pains in life and um, sometimes emotional pains are far greater than physical pains. Now we could say pain is ultimately an emotion. So in that sense, isn't all pain an emotion? Yes, that's true, but what is the source? Sometimes there is a physical wound which is causing the pain. So the physical sensation is cause of the pain. But sometimes there is nothing physically wrong. But emotionally, say a relationship has broken down or we have lost a loved one. Physically, we are not in immediate danger. So the fact that Arjun, despite being a trained warrior who is on the, most, on the battlefield for the most important war of his life, has become overwhelmed with emotion, so much that he is crying publicly. That indicates the magnitude of the trauma that he is in. Not only is he crying on the battlefield, but he is also crying at the point of maximum visibility. Maybe because he is right now, he is in between the two armies. So in general, Enlightenment is preceded by some kind of turbulence, some kind of distress, some kinds of devastation. The Bhagavad Gita later Krishna will say that there are four kinds of people who come to him. They are those who are distressed, those who are distressed, those who are distressed and those who are distressed. <laughs> so, of course, you say that is not correct. But the point is, that even if somebody is seeking knowledge, Krishna says four categories, those who, what are the four categories? 
artho, jigyasu, artharthi and jnani. So the distressed, the knowledge seekers, the inquisitive and the wealth seekers. So now yes, there are these four categories but in general, unless there is some distress, the other category of people will not usually turn toward God. Nowadays if you want to have gain some knowledge also or be inquisitive about something. There is uh, so many ways, so many places we can go to know things. You know, so somebody has car has broken down and another person, I know how to fix a car. So the person asks, do you know it or do you Google know it? <laughs> <laughs> do you really know it or do you just Google it and you think you know it now? Now of course you can learn from Google also but the point is that it's not necessary that just because somebody is seeking knowledge or somebody is inquisitive, one will necessarily come towards God. And similarly, when we talk, uh, talk about money, now today when people want money, they will probably go to a bank. They will not go to God for a loan, for, for getting money. So there are so many alternatives that are available that people may not turn towards God. Broadly speaking, in today's world, people turn towards God either because life is frustrating or life is unfulfilling. I wanted something very strongly in my life and I didn't get it. And so I'm frustrated. I don't know what, what should I do? How can I go on in that life? Or I wanted something very strongly. I got it, but I found it's an anticlimax. It, <laughs> it didn't live up to its expectations. So it's not that I am unhappy in the sense that there's a big distress in my life. It's just that what I thought will give me happiness has not given me happiness. Then we turn to it. So the, the, the jnani is in this category. They want some higher happiness. But the foundation is there has to be some distress. So here Arjuna's distress makes him receptive. Actually, there is a, if there is a deep meaningful conversation that is going on, then we could say in that conversation, there is constant death and reincarnation happening. Because when we, are discussing, when we are discussing with someone, then we had some idea, oh, that idea has to die. That's wrong. That is not a correct idea. And then, the, okay, my own conception about that thing changes. So there's a reincarnation. That idea changes. So there could be, you know, reincarnations of two types. This internal reincarnation is gradual. So sometimes some ideas, okay, incrementally they change. Okay, I had this understanding, but now I have this understanding. It's incremental change. But sometimes it is a drastic change. So a deep conversation leads to the evolution or complete transformation of ideas. And normally when we have a particular idea, that idea, that worldview is like the ground on which we stand. And when turbulence occurs, it's like the ground under us is being pulled. So for Arjun, he he had two primary roles for his life. Do you remember I discussed in last class about what was the essential conflict in Arjuna's mind? Two dharmas, Kula dharma and Kshatriya dharma. So he had two identities. Okay, I'm a, I'm a Kuru, I'm a member of the Kuru dynasty, and he also had identity that I'm a Kshatriya. But when these two identities start pulling him in two opposite directions, it's like say we stand in a boat. That's a little rocky. But if you stand in two boats, <laughs> and then the boats start going away from each other. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, initially we try to stand, you can stretch, stretch, stretch. But when the two boats start going too far away, you start to realize, I'm going to fall now. I cannot stretch this much. So we have multiple roles in life. And so if the two roles start pulling us rapidly and completely in opposite directions, then it's like the ground under us is no longer there. Where do we stand? So that can be extremely disorienting and that is what has happened to Arjuna. So here the significant point is Ashru Purna Kulekshanam. He was filled with tears and that indicates the magnitude to which he was overcome. Now interestingly, at this point when Krishna responds, Vacha Madhusudana, can you just have the translations like last time? No, not the translations, just the Sanskrit or the transliteration rather. Mm. No, no, only, the only the transliteration, so you can remove the synonyms as well as the translation. Only Sanskrit version. 
yeah, verse text. Thank you. Yeah, so go, so now let's so Krishna speaks two verses over here, but at this point, Krishna's mode of speaking is somewhat different. So let's look at these verses. We'll recite it together now. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Kutas Akashmalamidam Vishame Samupasthitam Anarya Jushtama Swargyam Akirti Karamarjuna. So Kutastva Kashmalamidam. So here both these points that Krishna makes are rhetorical questions. As you hear what is it? Kutastva, from where has this come upon you? This is not behu you, Kashmalam. This is a weakness, this is a contamination. And say for example, uh, there's a cricket match and there's a final over of a big cricket match and suddenly a bowler who is supposed to bowl or the batsman is supposed to bat, they get a case of nerves. You know, I can't play. This is so, this is a, if there's a very good batsman, the opponent in and the bowler has to bowl the last over. And the, the, the bowler may feel if I bowl, I lose, everybody will jeer me. So I don't want to bowl on me. <laughs> so let somebody else bowl. So now, come on, you can't do this. You cannot get overcome by weakness like this. Kutastva kashmalamidam. This is not the way you should function. Where has this come upon you? That means this does not belong to you. This does not be who you. So you are a Kshatriya, you are an Arya, and you should act in a worthy way. And the next verse Krishna says, Klaibyam masmagamah partha klaibya. This is Klaibya actually refers to weakness, especially the uh, weakness of a Kshudra, of a powerless person, of an important person. So, naitattvayupapadyate, so he used, to, he used two strong words, klaibya and kshudra. Now, kshudra is not a caste slur, it is a characteristic. See, well, the brahmana, brahman refers to that which is big. The biggest reality is called brahman. Kshudra is that which is small. So, a person who is large minded is a brahmana. A person who is small minded is a kshudra. So it's primarily here when Krishna is referring to it, you are being small minded. And Rudayat Daurbalyam, give up this weakness of the heart. Paranta. Arjun, you are the chastiser of enemies. Just give up this weakness. And so here the word Parantapa means, oh Arjun, you can chastise your enemy. So, just, so chastise this enemy of weak mindedness that is there within you. Don't give in to this weakness. This does not be who you. Naitat toy upapadyate. So now Arjun on hearing this feels indignant. He says, this is not weak mindedness. And he counters by another rhetorical question. So Arjun's question, Krishna's question was, how can, how can you act weakly like this? So he is saying this is not weak mindedness, this is thoughtfulness. And he asks a rhetorical question that would you, O Krishna, uh, fight against and kill your guru or your grandsire? Katham Bhishma Maham Sankhe Dronam Chamad Sudhana Ishu Bhi Pratiyotsyami Pujara Vari Sudhana Those whom I meant to worship, Pujara Hav, he says, that means that I meant to offer flowers in honor to them, how can I offer arrows to them? So he's saying that this is not weak mindedness, this is thoughtfulness. Sometimes two people are talking with each other, but sometimes they are talking past each other. Talking past each other means? they are actually speaking at different levels and whatever they talk because each of them has their own perception about things so it just the conversation doesn't move forward so that's what is happening over here and he makes a further next point that he says that if rudhir pradigdan if we fight then rudhir is blood that we will be covered by blood and no bro this next verse 2.5 so, Rudhir Pradhikdan, that we will be covered with blood. Everything that we gain will be tainted by blood. Now, in a sense, violence and bloodshed are inevitable in the war. But still, it is whose blood that is important. So, Guru Nahatva, he says that I don't want the blood of my gurus to come here. And it's interesting the word Guru. Guru is singular, Guru is plural. So, he's thinking of Bhishma also as a Guru. So, there are multiple gurus and he's saying, those who have taught me, if I gain something, is tainted by their blood. So, how can I gain it? Now, he's saying, Hattvartha kamams tu guru nihaiva. Now, the question might come that actually, don't think of them as gurus. Because they are not acting like gurus. Kamams tu guru nihaiva. 
so they have given up their position of being a guru because they are addicted to wealth so because drona and bhishma were maintained in a sense by the kauravas and they felt that they are bound there's a famous verse in the mahabharat which says that that bhishma tells yudhishthir that actually wealth is no one's servant but everyone is wealth servant and i am bound by the wealth of the kauravas so i have to fight against them now that is an external i have to fight for them that's an external reason which he gives over there internally we know that krishna wanted bhishma to fight on the side opposite to him so that they could exchange viraras and so that ultimately it would be demonstrated that no matter how great be the war warriors on the side of adharma ultimately dharma will win so that is but at this point the discussion is not going at that level it's more at an external level so he say uh, uh, that yes hatva arth kamam stu guru ni hai va so actually even if they are desiring wealth but still they are gurus so this raises a question that when does a person who is at a respectable position lose the right to that position so arjuna krishna is telling that they are aggressors they are you cannot you cannot give up your duty for them but he says no even if they are fighting against me even if they are attached to the wealth but still they are respectable for me so there is a difference between <clears throat> offering respect to someone and offering submission to someone respect means that yes i respect you for who you are but submission means i will do what you are telling me to do so we may respect many but we cannot submit to everyone and sometimes if a particular person is not acting in the right way then if we submit to them we will end up doing the wrong thing so for arjun he is equating respect with submission over here so there has to be respect no doubt anybody who has taught us anything there has to be some respect for them but we can't submit to them so here krishna he is saying that they have not lost their position but at this point he keeps thinking and he arrives at the he realizes that there is no easy way ahead whichever option i see is only loss over there so let's recite the sixth verse now 2.6 न चैतमह कतर नो गरीय यद्वाजयेम यदि वो जयेयु यान हवा न जिजी विशाम से अवस्थित प्रमुखे धार्तराष्ट्र सो ते अवस्थित दे आर सिचुएटेड हू आर दे दोज विदउट हूम वी वुड नॉट डिजायर टू लिव यान हवा न जिजी विशाम एक्चुअली our life becomes worth living because of certain things certain people certain values certain purposes and without that life wouldn't be worth living so he feels that without them i won't my life won't be worth living but if i want them to live then i won't be able to live because now we are already on the battlefield either i kill them or i'm killed by them and if i decide i don't want to be killed by them then what is going to happen is i am going to have to suffer in the sense that i am going to have to we will have to live in a forest and for a person to run to have been declared to run away from the battlefield that is also very painful so he just, he just doesn't see any easy way ahead and this brings him to the point of earlier he said i'm not going to fight now also that's what he will say but there's a difference whereas earlier it was a decision that i will not fight but here it is that i will not fight till i understand so earlier arjun was giving his understanding and saying therefore these are the reasons why i will not fight but here he says i want to know if i don't know how can i know? how can i continue and then the next verse is a well known verse and this verse is very important for one word in it pruchami tvam dharma sammudha chetaha i am asking you what is dharma every book has its own defining question the ramayana's defining question is what are the characteristics of an ideal person the mahabharatam's defining question is what is it 
What is the duty of a person about to die? The Mahabharat's question, defining question is, what is duty? Not just about to die, what is duty? What is dharma? So that same question, which is the defining and driving question of the Mahabharat, is also the defining question of the Gita. So Arjun is caught between these two dharmas, the Kshatriya dharma and the Kula dharma. So, so what is really dharma? What am I meant to do? What is the right course of action? So we all need a sense of orientation in life. Without that, we get completely confused. What do I mean by orientation? See, where we are going, where we are meant to go. If we don't understand this, then we are lost in our lives. Last time I quoted about the German thinker Friedrich Nietzsche who said that God is dead. Now there is the whole group of people called New Atheists. These are modern atheists and they are very celebratory. They say athe religion is the cause of all evil and atheism is the solution to all problems. That is their idea. And they all quote from these uh, thinkers like Nietzsche who were a, a few, few you know, maybe a hundred or so years ago. But people at that, now Nietzsche, he, when he spoke that God is dead, he said that if God has died, there is not enough water in the oceans of the world to dry the blood from our hands. We have sunk into a bottomless ocean. Why? Because without, without God, there is no overarching purpose for life. And when people have nothing worth fighting for, it's not that they will stop fighting. <laughs> they will start fighting over anything. <laughs> When we don't have anything worth fighting for, we'll start fighting for anything. Because any small thing somebody will make big and they will start fighting over that. So, <clears throat> what has happened is people have elevated small, small, small things to huge magnitudes. Mm -hmm. And small, small things can be, can vary from people, especially if you see today, there's so much love of pets. It's fine to have a pet, but you know, pets sometimes become the most important person in people's lives. And there is a yoga is very popular in the Western world. There is a variant of yoga which is called doga. <laughs> <laughs> doga is a portmanteau. It is a combined of two words: dog plus yoga. So it's the yoga that you do with your dog. So you want to share your entire life with your dog. So if I'm doing dog my yoga, I want to do it with dog. So there are actually doga trainers. And they train not just you how to do yoga, they train how to get your dog to do yoga. <laughs> and of course, another has come up now. There are some people who just don't like dogs. They like cats. So there is Koga also. <laughs> <laughs> so now, we all need something to love. So we will take something or the other and elevate it to a very big level. So dharma is not just some religion or some religious code. Dharma is ultimately a sense of orientation in life. What is life meant for? Where am I meant to go? So if you are driving, then we need to have some direction. Where are we going when we are driving? Others will be lost. If you consider a big ocean in which we are there and we don't know where to go, we will be lost. So Dharma is what is the right thing to do? What is the orientation for life? So we all have certain structures in our life that give us orientation. See, if we have a job, okay, this is what I have to do. If we are part of a family, this is my role in the family. Now, all these give us some orientation in life and they are very important. Now, these cannot give us ultimate orientation. So, sometimes the orientation that is given by these things, they, they just get disrupted. When they get disrupted, then what am I living for? So, unless we can have a sense of orientation that is beyond disruption, a sense of orientation that is beyond the world's disruption. If we don't have that, then sooner or later, we will end up disrupted and disoriented in life. So Arjuna had these structures, the Kula Dharma and Kshatriya Dharma to provide him orientation, but now he is disoriented. So I was with one devotee who was, who had gone to Sri Lanka when, for, food for, life, for food relief when the tsunami had occurred. He said he met so many people, they're just like, in one moment, a few moments, 
their whole family, their house, everything, their shop, everything was destroyed. It's like one man or one woman or one, one teenager just living. What am I to live for now? So he said that eventually when we went there, what we needed to provide people was not just food, they had enough food. We had to give them some trauma therapy. And it was, uh, they did some kirtans, they gave some talks and we need to, if our orientation in life is disrupted, then we need to have something else that will orient us again. And for most people, when there is no sense of orientation, they get completely lost. In general, for all of us, we will experience disorienting moments when some structure that we have that gets disrupted. So the Bhagavad Gita will provide Arjuna an orientation that will never be disrupted. And that will be, that is Arjuna's question. Pruchami tvam dharma What is dharma? Suppose we are, we enter a class and at a time when a question answer session is going on. And then we try to make sense. The points seem interesting. But if we are not, if we came after the question has already been spoken. And then we are hearing the answer. If we know the question, then the answer will make greater sense. And this point is good, this point is good, but how does it all fit in? Otherwise, all the points in the answers will be like attractive pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> but how do I fit it in? So similarly, if you want to understand the Bhagavad Gita, this understanding the question which it is answering is important. The question it is answering is, Puchamitvam Dharma. What is Dharma? How do I orient myself in life? And then the next verse, when he says, I will not fight, he says, he's clearly saying that there's no other solution that will work. So Arjun had still a trajectory. The trajectory is normally for Kshatriyas, the trajectory of their life was that they attain a prosperous kingdom in this world, or if they die, they attain prosperity in heaven. But Arjun is saying, Neither of these will work. That the grief that is drying up my senses. So there are two definitions of success for a Kshatriya. In this world, a prosperous kingdom, or in the next world, heavenly prosperity. But neither of these is going to work for me. And therefore, he says, I want you to tell me. Shishyasteham shadhi. Now at this point, again we will see 2.9, let's go. Tamu, let's recite this. Sanjay vacha eva muktvarushi kesham guda keshaha parantapa nayotsyati govindam uktvatu shrim babhuvaha nayotsya. Again he's saying, I will not fight. But this is a refusal to fight not as a decision to not fight but as a refusal to fight till a decision comes up till some enlightenment happens so it's like uh, first a doctor is telling take a medicine and the patient says I won't take the medicine and then the doctor says then the patient says you know I want to understand how this medicine works I want to understand what exactly the disease is till that point I won't take this medicine so there are two different things over here so Generally, we cannot, and we cannot help people unless they want to be helped. So, if you want to counsel someone, usually, unless they are open for counseling, unless they come to a level where they are asking for asking some questions, we can't really help them. Generally, most of us. If you have to give charity, it's a little pain in the heart. Oh, I'm going to lose my money. But there's one charity we all freely give. <laughs> what is that? Advice. advice, yes. All of us give advice very easily. Now, now our advice may be very wise also. Hmm? <laughs> but still, unless the other person values it, under the other person wants it, giving it is not very helpful. So Krishna does not give advice. So, till Arjun is approaching him. As a, a friend, he says, I don't, I don't think I'll I don't want to fight. Okay, you don't want to fight, that's fine. Krishna just talks with him at that level. He doesn't agree that you shouldn't fight. He talks with him at that level, saying that, hey, don't give in to weakness like this. But when Arjun asks, uh, Arjun changes the mood. And he says, 
I want to understand what is dharma. So then, what happens? Tam uvacha rishikesha prahasan iva bharata prahasan iva. He's as if smiling. So the idea here is that Krishna is appreciating how dramatic is the change in Arjun. That the warrior, has, the friend has now become a student. That in the middle of the battlefield, which is the, which is the place for action, urgent, immediate action, that is the place where instead of action, reflection is going to happen. The deepest reflection is going to happen. So the Bhagavad Gita setting itself is very amazing. To have philosophy spoken on the battlefield is indicative of how important philosophy is. Now some people say that you know, I am a go-getter. I want to achieve things in my life. I am not interested in philosophy. Yeah, that's fine, but even a go-getter needs to know where to go and what to get. <laughs> <laughs> so, now if they don't know that, then they'll just be wandering around aimlessly. So Arjuna is also a go-getter. But at this particular point, he has recognized that I lost my orientation, I've become disoriented. So seeing this difference, uh, this is a dramatic change. Uh, Krishna is smiling and Vishidantam, well Arjuna is lamenting, Krishna is smiling. Now what does it mean? It's not that Krishna is happy that Arjuna is lamenting. Rather Krishna is happy that Arjuna is going to be enlightened right now. So it's like a patient, sometimes what happens is a patient is sick, a patient has a disease, but the, if there's a, it's a serious disease, the patient is in denial. If somebody comes to that, you have got cancer, he says, no, no, I can't have cancer, no, no, no. Initially, there is a denial. And as long as there is denial, there cannot be treatment. So when the patient comes out of denial, the doctor is happy. Now the doctor is ha not happy that the patient is sick, but the doctor is happy that the patient has come out of denial. So Arjun, because he has come out of denial, so Vishidantam and Prahasan, that contrast is there. Krishna is happy. Now, when Krishna be begins speaking, let's see what the first verse he speaks. So, any questions or comments till now? Yes. Hello. So, uh, so, what do you mean by a rhetorical question? I don't understand. Okay, what is rhetorical question? Rhetoric is one particular way of uh, well, of of speaking, po making points persuasively. The Greek thinkers who developed it quite a bit. It's used in Indian tradition also. But rhetorical question means a question whose answer is self-evident. If you are hungry, will a garland make you happy? <laughs> now, there is no answer except yes to it. It will not make me happy. I mean, no, I mean, no, no, it will not make me happy. So the question is asked not to, not to specifically get an answer, but the answer is, con the point is conveyed through a question. So rhetorical question is the qu a question in which the answer is implicit. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Like Arjun, all of us inevitably has to face this duality. Uh, of we often find ourselves in a crossroad of two decisions to be taken, and both of them seem to be promis promising, and there is no promising no further. Sometimes even in uh, future life, like there could be two uh, different opinions, and both might have Prabhupada said back up things. So, <laughs> Now here Krishna was directly there, of course, with the world. But there are Siksha Gurus and there are so many things. So how how does one actually uh, um, take a proper decision? Which is okay. So if there are two decisions, which two courses of action, which both of them seem promising, both of them also have some backing from scripture. So what do we do at that time? Yeah, we don't have Krishna with us. But it's not that we don't have Krishna entirely with us. 
generally, if we consider our life, there are some things which we clearly know we should do, some things which we know we should not do. Now, if we are doing the things which we are meant to do and not doing the things which we are not meant to do, by that we are showing Krishna that we want guidance. But if we are not doing those things which are clearly known what we should be doing, then we are showing Krishna we don't want guidance. So then there is a gray zone in life for every one of us. But there is also black and white. But if we extend the gray to black and white also, and say, okay, this also, I need to do this. So I need to do this. Then what happens if we show Krishna we don't want guidance, then he will not give us the guidance. Because that's what we don't. But if we are doing what we are meant to do, then we are showing Krishna that we want guidance, then he will give it to us. Either it will come as an innate conviction, this is what I should be doing. Uh, and or it can come as some crystal clear insight from someone whom we are discussing. I, we discussed this last time, broadly speaking, that are right and wrong, how to decide that? There are three factors in it. Intent, content and consequence. Now, why am I doing it? What exactly am I doing? And what will be the result of doing this? This is what the Mahabharata broadly says for decision making. So initially, Yudhishthir Maharaj is, so there are basically two kind, two concepts, you can say there are two ethical theories, or two theories about ethics. One is categorical ethics, the other is contextual ethics. Categorical ethics means that this is the category of right and this is the category of wrong. And that's all there is to it. That's categorical ethics. So speaking lies is wrong and one should never do it. That's categorical. But contextual ethics means that yes, there is a category of right and wrong. But suppose some rioters have come to kill a friend of ours. And that person comes and uh, is hiding, hiding in our house and we give them shelter and the rioters knock on the door. Is this person here? What should we do at that time? If we speak the truth, the consequence will be that person will die. So, he, so although true, speaking falsehood is in the category of wrong things, but here the consequence takes precedence. So content is important and content needs to be a primary parameter for deciding right or wrong. But content is not the sole parameter. So traditionally we know by our conscience, by our culture, certain things are right, certain things are wrong. But the context determines the consequence, the context also shapes the intent. So based on that we have to make a decision. So yes, this is what Prabhupada said this also, Prabhupada said this also. But in this situation, what is most workable? What is most effective? What will serve the purpose of Srila Prabhupada? The Prabhupada's purpose was to help people, help us become Krishna conscious, help us to help others become Krishna conscious. So, if something that is Prabhupada said is alienating people, is making it difficult for them to come to Krishna, then maybe that is not what should be done over here. It of course depends on what it is. But broadly, if we have that overall purpose in mind. Ultimately, the purpose is to attract people toward Krishna. So if that consequence is not happening, then, then we have to see, we have to re-examine the content. So our intent may be that, oh, I want to present Prabhupada as it is. That's good. But our intent also has to be that I want to connect people with Krishna. So Prabhupada would say that if you speak something and people go away, that's a failure. People should be able to connect. So intent, content, consequence are three factors by which we decide. Okay. Thank you. So let's move on. Prabhu, if you have any comments, please feel free to share any. Thank you. Now, from here onwards, Arjuna, Krishna starts speaking. And it's interesting what Krishna speaks, for the first the first word that he speaks is, let's recite this, Shri Bhagavan Vacha Ashochan and Vashochastvam Pragyavadam Shabhashase Katasunagata Sumscha Nanushochanti Panditaha. You know, what we believe is seen in how we live. What we believe is seen in how we live. So, our conceptions should be seen through our actions. And some people may say, I believe in God, 
but they act in very godless ways, very ungodly ways. So that belief in God can be very alienating for others. If a devotee is very domineering, very, uh, very, very judgmental, very short-tempered, very possessive, then people think, what kind of what kind of devotion is this? So we may have certain beliefs, we may speak a lot, but our actions show where we are at. So Krishna is telling Arjun, there is a mismatch over here. You are speaking learned words, but your actions and your emotions are not learned. You are lamenting for that which is not worthy of lamentation. So, ultimately, education should lead to the transformation of our actions and not just our actions, the transformation of our emotions. So, it's, if a, sometimes if somebody chooses to become a surgeon, and a surgeon means they have to see blood. They have to not just see blood, they have to, they have to cut it which will cause blood to come out. Now if a surgeon becomes squeamish, you know, I don't want to cut, I don't want to cause blood. Well, then you are in the wrong job, isn't it? You cannot be sentimental over there. So Krishna is telling Arjun that you are speaking learned words, but you are letting yourself get carried away by sentimentality. If a surgeon has to amputate a limb, that's painful. Cutting somebody's body is never not pleasant. But the surgeon, if he has knowledge, sees the big picture, and if this limb is not cut, ultimately the whole person the person will die, the whole body will suffer. So therefore, this has to be done. So the Bhagavad Gita's the Kurukshetra war is like a surgery. Arjun, sorry, the Kauravas are like a diseased limb in the social body. And unless they are amputated, the whole social body will rot. And Krishna is telling Arjun that you, have to, you, your emotions are not educated. And then he starts talking about the soul. So first he says, we are all eternal. I, you, everyone is eternal. And we say, how are we eternal? He says, the, the body is changing, but inside the body, there is something that is eternal. And then, and then there's, there's all verses are familiar, we will not go recite the verses. <clears throat> so then he says, okay. But so that is so the, that is Dehino Smitha De. Then the verse after that is Mat, can just keep going down. Matra Sparsha. So he says, there, but somebody might say that actually I still feel pain, even if I know that I'm not the body, still body sensations cause pain. He says, tolerate them. They're temporary. Now tolerate them for what purpose? That he tells in the next verse. 2.15, can you we'll decide this one? Yam hi navyatayante te purusham purusharshabha. So, tolerance is a tool to transcendence. Tolerance is not an end in itself. See, Krishna is not telling Arjun to make tolerance into the supreme virtue. If tolerance was the supreme virtue, Krishna could have said to Arjun, just tolerate the Kaurav's atrocities. And why fight the war? So, we have to tolerate so that we can transcend. So, earlier I gave the example of an ocean. So, in an ocean, if somebody has to go in a particular direction, then, now in the ocean sometimes, some part of the sea might seem smooth, some part, some part of the sea, might, sea might, smooth, might seem stormy. Now, if somebody starts deciding based on how the sea looks, which direction they go, then, uh, they will not never get to the destination. Oh, that part of the sea looks nice. I'll go there. But they get there and the storm reaches there also. And then they get out of there and go somewhere else and the storm will come there also. So, in if somebody is going through the ocean, they have to go where their destination is. Not just where the storm is peaceful, where the, the sea is peaceful. Yes, sometimes the storm is there, then you may have to do some, maybe check yourself, slow down or just uh, uh, do some kind of course correction, but ultimately, where one goes in an ocean is determined not by how the ocean is, but where the land is. So Krishna is telling, he's basically talking about the body and the soul. He says the body is where the ocean, the material level of reality is where the ocean is, and the spiritual level of reality is where the land is. So he's saying that you tolerate and persevere. 
Tolerance is not passivity, tolerance is perseverance. You persevere, even if there is a stormy, don't give up that path. Keep moving along that path. And then, Amritatvaya Kalpate, you will attain immortality by that. So, transcendence means you will attain eternal reality. You will attain eternal happiness. And the same point Krishna says in the next verse, this is a quite Upanishadic verse, where na sato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha. So, this is in English. <clears throat> if you see asat and bhava, they are the words in the first line. And the second line is abhava and sata. So, there is inversion. There is a, in English, this is called as chiasmus. Chiasmus means you change the sequence of the word. Like, say, John F. Kennedy said that ask not what the nation has done for you, ask what you have done for the nation. So, there are two parts of a sentence, of a sentence, and they are inverted in the second half. So, na sato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sata. So, the Bhagavad Gita has many poetic ornaments. Actually, I have all seminar on the poetic ornaments in the Bhagavad Gita, which is, we will go through some of them as we go through over here. But Krishna is making this point that that there is the material, there is the spiritual. Like I said just now, there is land and water. So, the ocean will never be steady and the land will never shake. So, don't be just caught in the appearance of how the ocean looks and go there in that direction. Go where the land is. So, live in such a way that you can rise to spiritual consciousness. Then after that, he talks, now after that he starts talking about the soul and stresses repeatedly that the soul is indestructible. Mm -hmm. that it cannot be destroyed and he contrasts once again 2.18 let's keep going ahead so you can go now to <coughs> 2.22 so essentially here Krishna is talking about how the soul will never die the soul is always eternal and then this is an interesting verse 2.20 no, let's go to 2.22 only let's recite this verse Vasam Sijirnani Yatha Vihaya Navani Grihanati Naro Parani now, this verse describes what, what is called as, in philosophy, it is called as radical dualism. Dualism means that there are, now in our context, we use dualism to refer to that, that God and the soul are different. In today's mainstream philosophy, they use dualism to refer to that there are two levels of reality, matter and spirit. So, most people are today materialistic and normally when we use the word, have you heard the word monism? Yes. What is monism? One reality. So, that now generally we equate that with mayavad, impersonalism. But actually, monism means, it simply means there is only one reality. So, you could have material monism and spiritual monism. So, the, the impersonalists, some of them are spiritual monists. Because they say, Brahman is all that exists. Which is true, but within Brahman there is differentiation. Whereas, you could say, people who are materialistic and atheistic, they are also monists, but they are material monists. They say, only one thing exists. So, they are... So, there, there are different kinds of material. There are functional materialists and there are fanatical materialists. Functional materialists are those who say matter is all that matters. When something else is there, doesn't matter. Hmm? But fanatical materials are, they are pure devotees of matter. <laughs> <laughs> say matter is not all that matters, matter is all that exists. Nothing exists beyond matter. That is what they argue. So, here, Krishna is saying that, uh, uh, that when the worldview that Krishna, uh, uh, Krishna outlines is from the modern framework, it is dualistic. Dualistic means there is body and there is soul and the two are separate. Now, the relationship between them is very functional. Functional means that he is saying that the soul and the body, they are just related the way the body and the dress are related. So now, any of us can wear any dress that we want. So, the dress is meant to serve a functional purpose. Now somebody, if they are going in a very hot weather, they might wear a very thin, a cotton kind of dress, but if they are going cold weather, they can wear a very different dress. 
and sometimes the person can depending on the way they are dressed they can look entirely different so, but the person is different from the dress so krishna talks about that there is a radical difference between the soul and the body there are many uh, most many religions talk about the soul even christianity talks about the soul but the word soul does not necessarily mean the same thing for different people see words there are there are terms and there are concepts and the two are not necessarily related I give the example often that uh, you have a suitcase a suitcase you cannot carry if the suitcase has no handle it becomes difficult to carry isn't it so the suitcase is like the concept and the term is like the handle so terms are verbal concepts are intellectual or mental so the terms are handles for the suitcase of the concept so once i was traveling here only in america and i was going for one place to another and just as i was leaving uh, this my suitcase handle broke <laughs> so i asked can you fix this the devotee said that actually in america buying a new suitcase is easier than fixing one <laughs> so we didn't have time to buy also so that devotee gave their suitcase to me then i took that suitcase now usually i don't carry mine we give the wheelchair assistant and going to check in so by the time <coughs> i came and i went to the baggage carousel i for, i had forgotten what the suitcase looks like <laughs> it was i only remembered the suitcase had a red handle so then all the red handle suitcase we were taking out <laughs> and you see is this our suitcase is our suitcase so as so then it struck me that you know we can have a similar handle for many suitcases so similarly the same word the word is like a handle but which suitcase it is attached to is important <laughs> is it <laughs> so we may all use the word soul but what are we referring to many people use the word soul to refer to uh, in christianity there is no conception of the soul and the body being different that's why they have resurrection and that's why they at least mainstream christianity today does not accept reincarnation because their idea is that when you are reunited the soul and the body will be when when you are resurrected rather the soul and the body will be together and there cannot be consciousness without the body of course there are a lot of philosophical problems with this this is that say if somebody dies when they are very old then which body will they have if they have old body for the rest of eternity <laughs> well that is not a heavenly prospect is it <laughs> even if they are in heaven hmm? and now everybody will have a young body but what if somebody dies when they are infant they never had a young body so how are they going to get that young body isn't it so the conflation of body and soul is very problematic say if they, they they basically what they do is they eternalize the material they eternalize the material so all the relationships that are there all the roles that are there they eternalize them and because especially the catholics are a little more philosophical than the protestants so the catholics especially have a problem with divorce now they say that what is the problem metaphysically speaking say the, the horizontal relationships are eternal so if you divorce your spouse and you marry someone else then who will be your spouse in heaven <laughs> <laughs> the one you divorced or the one you remarried you know? <laughs> now they say that that the relationships are eternal so it becomes quite problematic so of course the current pope he said that now people love dogs so much so he said so in their idea the souls are present only in humans animals don't have souls so animals have consciousness they have their own differentiation they say that animals have spirit but not soul now we say ask what is the difference between spirit and soul they say spirit is what gives consciousness soul is what gives the consciousness that can search for spirituality so now we understand that the difference is of degree not of category if the consciousness of the human beings is more developed that's why we can pursue spirituality in animals the consciousness is not developed so much so we can't pursue spirituality but it's not that there are two different kinds of souls but that's their idea that animals don't have souls of the kind we humans have that's why they say we can we can cut animals and eat animals but now people love dogs so much so the current pope said that actually 
if a dog serves a faithful Christian, the dog will also go to heaven with that. And you can be reunited not just with your family members, but also with your dogs. <laughs> <laughs> So if you see many of these Christian books, they talk about they talk about heaven, and if you see in heaven, they are all happy people, men, women, children, everyone. You'll see the pictures. The pictures filled with all happy people in heaven. The only person missing in heaven is God, <laughs> <laughs> because it's all the, in. In principle, they say it's God-centered, but they have no clear conception of God. It's not very clearly described in their tradition. So this is not to criticize Christianity. Prabhupada said that they also aspire for love for God. And in that sense, they're also devotees. But the philosophical clarity that the Bhagavad Gita provides, it is not there over there. So although they talk about the soul, their conception of the soul is somewhat different. Basically, for them, the soul is like a metaphorical reference to our non-material essence. It's, it's, we have something non-material and it's a metaphorical way of referring to it. It's like we may say that, uh, um, see the word soul and spirit are used in that sense. Say, there is, uh, say somebody in an unsportsmanly way makes, uh, gets somebody out. This was against the spirit of cricket. Now what do you mean by spirit? There is no soul of cricket that is, uh, is like, is going around in the cricket field or something like that. The spirit refers to the way it should be played. So, so for example, in the WTC, the Twin Towers had crashed. He said, so an American president had said that the, the soul of America is shattered. Now, what he meant over there is the soul refers to the essence, the core of what we believe, what we live for. So, in the Christian tradition broadly, the soul is metaphorical. In the Bhagavad Gita, the soul is not metaphorical, it is metaphysical. The soul is not metaphorical, but metaphysical. Metaphysical means meta is above. Physical is body. So uh, above the body. So although so the although the soul and the body, the soul is commonly used in both traditions, but this verse which talks about the soul as another category of reality. That the body is a reality, it's like a dress, the soul is a reality like the, <clears throat> like the core person and the body keeps changing. So the relationship between the body and the soul is functional. Now when you say functional, it doesn't mean it is unimportant. The kind of dress we are wearing, for that function it is important. And say if we are in cold and we have only one sweater, we will have to keep it carefully. Because we need it at that time. So for us, the body is important. So there is, the soul is, the so we could say, the body is functional, the soul is fundamental. And both are important. But their importance is a hierarchy. If you see, <coughs> it is not that the Bhagavad Gita recommends the rejection of the body. Ultimately, Krishna will tell Arjuna, act according to your bodily nature. So we don't reject the body, but we reject the reduction of our self-conception to the level of the body. We don't think that I am the body. So this connection is very, so sometimes people say that, some critics of the Bhagavad Gita, they say that this, the Bhagavad Gita, the, the radical differentiation between the body and the soul will lead to a radical material rejection. That you, know, you won't care for anything material. If you consider the body is completely separate from you, you won't care for the body. And you won't care for the world. But that is not the case. The Bhagavad Gita has spoken so that Arjun would fight a war. So we understand that the body is also important because the body is a tool for the soul. And this is very interestingly seen in, if you go back earlier, I said in 2.13 Krishna says you are not the body or the soul. But 2.14, most of us know this verse. Can we recite that? Matra sparshas tu kaunteya, shitoshna sukha dukha daha, agama paino nityas, kam stitikshas swabharata. So here Krishna is using two names for Arjuna. Which are they? Kaunteya and Bharata. Now if you see, both these names are related to his body. 
Just now Krishna has said you are not the body, but they say, oh, you who are the son of Kunti, do your duty, tolerate. Oh, you who are born in the Bharata dynasty, do your duty. So what is going on? If I am not the body, then how can I be Kunteya? See, the function, the, the idea is that the fundamental identity is there. And the functional identity is meant to further our fundamental purpose in life. So, uh, living spiritually is not easy. So, whatever way, whatever supports us for living spiritually, we use that. So, Arjuna's functional identity, okay, you are born in a great, so yes, uh, tolerating things, tolerating uh, the loss of bodily relationships, it's difficult. So, tolerating any bodily pain is difficult. But you, O oh Arjuna, are capable of doing difficult things because you are born in a great dynasty, you are born to a great mother. So the idea is that the functional is meant to be used for the spiritual. Prabhupada, uh, when he would come to India, in India was not that, see when Prabhupada went, left India he, in 1965, he had been trying to share Krishna Bhakti for a long time with Indians. But not, they are not very serious about it. Now, Sumti Moraji, when she, she Prabhupada approached her for a, a ticket to go to America, she said, Swamiji, if you want to speak Bhagavatam, you come to my house, every evening I will hear Bhagavatam from you. <laughs> now, Prabhupada did not want to speak Bhagavatam as a pious ritual. Prabhupada wanted to speak Bhagavatam as a means of spiritual transformation. So, now, when he came back in 1970s with his disciples, the basic Indian reality had not changed. So it's not that we will see among Shri Prabhupada's disciples, very few are Indians, especially those who are leaders, and very few are Indians who were introduced in India. Very few. So what happened? At that time, India was very captivated by nationalism. We just got independent 15, 15 20 years ago, and the hope was India will become great now. And Prabhupada, when he went back to India, because the Indian Milu, Indian setting was not receptive for spirituality as spirituality. See, America, the environment was, the hippies had more or less rejected everything mainstream. They had rejected education, they had rejected career, they had rejected family, they had rejected even hygiene, everything. <laughs> hmm? So, Prabhupada said in a lecture, the hippies had done Sarva Dharma and Prithich. <laughs> <laughs> I taught them how to do Mamekam Sharnam Raja. <laughs> so, <clears throat> when Prabhupada presented it that way, so basically they had more or less re rejected all functional identity. Then Prabhupada focused directly on the fundamental identity. Okay. Just, but Indians were not in the mood of rejecting their functional identity. So, if you see most of Prabhupada's preaching in India, was Prabhupada tapped into the mood of cultural nationalism that was there. So that's why Prabhupada's plan was also, Indians are enamored by Westerners. So if I go to the West and make Westerners into devotees, then seeing that Indians, they want to imitate them, they will imitate this also. So now it's interesting, if you see in the newspaper articles about Prabhupada's Western disciples and many, many people uh, appreciated and supported Prabhupada. But their idea was, at that time at least, oh, our India is so great that these foreigners are following our culture. So Prabhupada at that time tapped into that. He started, there was no concept of life membership in his American outreach. But in India he realized that people, he recognized that people are not ready right now for committed spiritual practice. So he said, connect, let them get connected, let them give some, give some financial support and let them get the books. So the culture was there, but the commitment in terms of serious spiritual practice and the philosophical reorientation of life, that was not there. So Prabhupada tapped into that. And Prabhupada, many of his lectures, especially new people, he would speak that, this is, this is uh, in one, one lecture in Mumbai, he says, this Bhagavad Gita is, is a book from India. He says, but to teach the Bhagavad Gita in India, I have to get people from America. <laughs> so he said, this is your book, learn this and teach it. He, Prabhupada says, you know, he Bhagavad Gita ke liye dunya mein bahut market hai. He says, there's a lot of market in all over the world. And he says, you people are afraid, you are people this is lamenting that India lost Pakistan. 
So you teach the Bhagavad Gita, the whole world will become Hindustan. <laughs> so now, what is Prabhupada doing? Now, Prabhupada, at one level, philosophically, he says, we are not Hindus, we are not Indians. <laughs> but if that is the mood, use that to make people connect with Krishna. So we cannot reject our fun functional identity. We connect our functional identity with our fundamental or ultimate identity. So we, if you ask, Prabhu, what is, what is your name? I am a spirit soul. <laughs> well, okay, I know, I understand that, but that is of no functional use, isn't it? <laughs> if I want to identify you, <laughs> if I want to connect with you, I want to relate to you. Say, I was spirit soul is of no functional use. So we have to have functional identity in this world, and the functional identity should not take us away from our fundamental identity. The functional identity should take us toward our fundamental identity. So, you can go back again to 2.22. The whole reason why I was talking about this is that although the Bhagavad Gita talks philosophically in terms of a radical differentiation between matter and spirit, but functionally both are integrated together for one purpose. So any questions about this till now? Any questions or comments? Okay, yeah, there is the mic. So this uh, identity also uh, leads towards our identity crisis and hence balancing uh, our you know, the two sides. So how does uh, one achieve, like, uh, of course, like here, Krishna said to Arjun, Mom, you know, you just say, think of me and thanks. But practically, at least for me, when I go in my office, I forget <laughs> everything mm -hmm. again. So yeah. absorbed when it just... <laughs> Amazing, I also look at other people that are so absorbed, they just so okay, how yeah. do we balance uh, this identity crisis? So how do we stay spiritually focused and not get not get into identity crisis while functioning in the world? Yeah. There is no reference in the Mahabharata that when Arjun was shooting in the Kurukshetra was for shooting arrows. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. <laughs> no. When he was fighting, he was fighting, isn't it? So, <clears throat> sometimes some people need to take chanting as an excuse for not being responsible. You know, if somebody's, they've done something wrong and somebody's angry with them, why did you do this? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> you know, that's not what we are meant to do. Chanting is one way we connect with Krishna, <laughs> but <coughs> <laughs> ultimately we are meant to offer ourselves to Krishna and that means taking responsibility for ourselves. So for what, for if a particular service requires focus, then we need to focus on that. Now suppose say somebody, suppose somebody is supposed to give a class and they come, uh, people come for a class and at the time of class they start, they start chanting throughout the class. Well, that's nice, but then tell us it is a kirtan session, not a class, isn't it? So we can't conflate or dissolve differences between different roles. If somebody is going to give a, somebody is going to do a kirtan, kirtan is wonderful. Somebody is going to give a class, that's then they have to actually prepare for a class and give a class, isn't it? There are there are different limbs of devotional service, and there are different ways of doing devotional service, and each way has to be done in a responsible way. Chanting is important, but if chanting alone were all important, Prabhupada could have stayed in Vrindavan and chanted only. Why did Prabhupada come to the West? Why did Prabhupada travel all over the world? Why did Prabhupada write his books? Why did Prabhupada set up and try to manage his con with all the headaches that came with it? So that is because he also wanted to create an infrastructure by which people could chant. And he wanted his followers also to maintain and expand that infrastructure. So if a particular role requires a particular frame of mind for us to do it in, then we have to adopt that frame of mind. And that is responsibility in devotional service. Now as far as our jobs are concerned, yes, we need to be professional and committed over there. You know, we could say absorbed or obsessed, or depending on the perspective. But <clears throat> if our overall life is oriented for serving Krishna, then the specific aspects of our life will fall in place. So it's that if we become so obsessed with our job that we start neglecting Krishna Bhakti entirely. 
then that is unhealthy. So, <clears throat> as we keep practicing bhakti regularly, Krishna starts coming more and more in the forefront of our awareness. Initially, he is in the background, he is there somewhere, but as you keep practicing bhakti, he starts coming in the forefront. Oh, when I first came to America and then after that I went back to India, you know, many of my relatives who had, who had for like 15, 17, 20 years, they had thought that I was a gone case, <laughs> that I had just wasted my life. They came and they called me and they told me, your life has become successful now. <laughs> yeah, when I was studying, I had an opportunity to come to America. When I didn't come to America, they said, you have wasted your life. And so now for them, going to America is a big thing. Now, when I came to America first time, I was excited. But then, after coming for a few times, you know, where I am is not as important as what I am speaking. So when this newness to something, that thing stays in the forefront of our awareness. But once the newness fades, then where we are is not import as important as why we are. So similarly for us, when we are doing our job, where we are, we have to be aware of it. But gradually as we keep practicing bhakti, yes, in our job sometimes there is crisis, there is emergency, there are deadlines and we have to be absorbed in it. But as we keep getting more and more experienced, that does not completely consume our consciousness. Yes, this is there, but Krishna is also there in our, our awareness. And as we keep practicing bhakti, doing our sadhana, gradually Krishna starts coming to the forefront of our awareness. So if we have to, the most important thing is that we have to do our services responsibly. And while doing our services responsibly, we try to be as devotional as possible. See, in devotional service, there is a noun and there is an adjective. Which is the noun? Service. Devotional is the adjective. So the idea is if you look at 12.8 to 12, Krishna talks about a hierarchy. You be absorbed in me spontaneously. If you can't be absorbed in me spontaneously, then be conscientiously absorbed in me. If you can't be conscientiously absorbed in me, then work for me. If you can't work for me, then you give up your fruit of your work for some good cause. So Krishna is giving a hierarchy. In that hierarchy, the point is that if you, even if we can't be devotional in our service, continue your service the devotional will, attitude will gradually come. So maybe at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, we can remember Krishna. And during the day, if we have some, if we have some breaks, maybe during lunch break, we can hear something. We can pray and offer the work to Krishna. Narayana Eti Samarpayami. So gradually, we insert Krishna, a Krishna's conscious remembrance in, in segments during our, uh, during the pattern, course of our life. And gradually, by that uh, segments of Krishna's conscious remembrance, Krishna will become more and more prominent in our consciousness. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, I wanted to ask us whether um, our old forgetting orientation in life could not following our Varnashrama Dharma be a cause of not having orientation in life. Uh, because in this age, all of us are traveling, are working across countries, leaving our families somewhere, and coming and working somewhere with different domains of job. But does Varnashama Dharma sh still should be followed as piously as? Uh, so, <coughs> is not, does not following Varnashram Dharma lead to disorientation in life? Should we follow Varnashram Dharma? The Varanashram Dharma has an ultimate pur purpose. Varanashram Acharvita Purushena Purapuan Vishnu Aradhite Panta Nanya Tatto Shakarana. Its purpose is to worship Lord Vishnu. So there is, we could say there are specifics and there is principle. The principle of Varanashram is to harmonize our material nature with our spiritual purpose. That means if a Kshatriya is, has a Kshatriya nature, they want to manage, rule, delegate, get things done. So to harmonize our material nature with our spiritual purpose. If you tell a Kshatriya to be like an intellectual, like a Brahmana, Kshatriya will find it very difficult. See, everybody has problems in life. The expertise of Varanashram is to allot to people the problems they like to face. <laughs> <laughs> So, if you tell a Kshatriya, ah, you know, 
can you find this verse in the Bhagavatam which says that that sometimes in emergency, even if you speak something which is counterfactual, that is okay. So Kshatriya is, come on, fix it, do it. He says, come on, just give the class without the words. Who will notice? <laughs> <laughs> a Brahmana, I told that, hey, really, where can it be? I mean, this past time, this past time, a Brahmana will feel stimulated by that. So everybody has to face problems, but if they are given the ch problems that they like to face, then they can be relatively happier than otherwise. So that is the principle to harmonize our material nature with our spiritual purpose. Now how exactly to do it in today's world, that way that is something which is still being deliberated broadly in our moment. So whether that means uh, creating divisions, uh, then even if we create divisions like that, who will decide who belongs where? Mm -hmm. So the important thing, uh, rather than thinking of it at a, society, uh, at a soci societal or a institutional level, we can see that at an individual level, we try to understand our nature, what we feel inspired to do, what we, f what we are good at doing. To understand our nature, there are probably two things, what, 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 what we are competent at and what we are comfortable doing. So guna karma vibhagasha, guna means that we are competent at that. Karma, no, guna means uh, we are comfortable doing it, internally we feel good about it. And karma means we are competent about it. So if we can see those two things and then we engage ourselves accordingly, then we could say that we are broadly serving the purpose of Varanashram. Varanashram is like a airport for the takeoff of the airplane. The takeoff of the airplane is our spiritual growth. So now, generally an airplane will require an airport to take off. But even if there is a very, very big and safe and active, say, airport in, in New York. Now, if in San Jose we have to build an airport, San Jose, we cannot make a replica of that airport. We have to consider geography over here, we have to consider the atmosphere over here, climate. So the purpose is not to recreate the airport, the purpose is to replicate the takeoff. The purpose is to replicate the takeoff. So similarly, we need some social structure by which we can take off spiritually. So now what that structure will be, we have to see according time, place, circumstance. Whether we can entirely replicate Varanashram, we can partially replicate Varanashram, or we can focus primarily on the purpose of Varanashram in whatever situation we are in. We have to see that and we have to continue practicing bhakti accordingly. So we focus on the takeoff and channel the principle that use our material nature to pursue our spiritual purpose. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. So in Bhagavad Gita in the 18th chapter, in Bhagavad Gita in 18th chapter, um, Arj uh, Krish uh, Krishna asked Arjuna that uh, you need to uh, remember me and fight. So it's like uh, um, kind of remembering is very important. And even in Bhagavatam, uh, Lord Brahma is saying, Vihayo Narayana Vishnu. Hmm. So you have to remember that's the main goal. Um, and Kunti's prayer, that you have yeah. to, uh, she is praying for constantly remembering Krishna as the river flows into the ocean. So it looks like constantly remembering Krishna, even while doing our duties, is the aim of our goal. Like life. Isn't constantly remembering Krishna while doing our duties the aim of life? Yes, of course. Now, what do we mean by constantly remembering Krishna? Is it that a devotee has to l split the consciousness in two parts, like live like a schizophrenic? <laughs> that you know, one, one part of my consciousness, I am doing my work, the other part, I am remembering Krishna. No, remembrance of Krishna is, is at multiple levels. See, Krishna is not just another person. Krishna is the supreme person. And that means that, see, if we have to remember, normally when we use the word remembrance, what do we think? Maybe if we have to remember someone, look at the photo of that person, or if they're there, we pay attention to them. Uh, we absorb also the thoughts of them. That's what we normally think of as remembrance. And th that's true. And that is also a remembrance of Krishna, which we do cultivate during a sadhana bhakti. We take darshan of Krishna, we chant his holy names. I sing his kirtans. 
But we have to understand that Krishna is not not like a finite, limited person. Krishna is supreme. So, if we remember Krishna's purpose in this world, so when Arjuna was fighting the war, as he was not chanting Hare Krishna. But that, was that meaning? Does that mean he was not Krishna conscious? No, he was conscious of Krishna's purpose, and he was doing Krishna's purpose. So if we are if we are doing some managing for a big festival. Now, at that time, if you're talking with someone, you know, don't park your car here, park your car there. Now, we are remembering Krishna in the sense that we are this is doing it for Krishna's purpose. So, when you say Krishna will come more and more in the forefront of our consciousness, that means that purpose will come in the forefront of our consciousness. And what I am doing, I am doing it for Krishna. See, broadly speaking, whenever we do anything, there are some things in our control, some things not in our control. The things that are in our control, we try to control them for the purpose of Krishna. We do have to, if Prabhupada wanted us to do devotees in the service, as expertly as possible. So, expertly means what is in our control, we control it well. Prabhupada wanted that if you are cooking food, food should be delicious. At one level, when you are cooking food to make it delicious, that means you are being a controller controlling exactly put this much ingredient don't put this heat it for this much time so we are trying to control things so that we get a particular result so the things that we are in, we have control over we control them for the purpose of krishna and the things that we don't have control over we understand that krishna has control over them now we can say that krishna has control over the things that we are con we have control over also that's true Krishna is the supreme controller. At the same time, Krishna is the supreme controller. He is not the sole controller. He has given us free will. And with our free will, if you want to use it properly, that's wonderful. If you want to abuse it, Krishna will allow us to do it. So the things which are in our control, we control them. Remembering Krishna means that we keep Krishna as the purpose in our mind. I am doing this for Krishna. And the things that are not in our control, we entrust them to Krishna. That Krishna will take care of this. That's why we will not get fearful, we will not get worried, we will not get paranoid because Krishna is in control of those things. So to remember Krishna means to remember Krishna's controllership, to remember Krishna's purpose. And gradually as that starts becoming more and more, then the more a personal relationship with Krishna is developed, the more we will remember Krishna as a person more and more. So we shouldn't see it like a, a digital logic, one or zero. It's analog progression. So the awareness of Krishna starts becoming more and more. And yes, ultimately, we want to remember Krishna constantly. And we want to remember him even while we are doing our work. But it's not that we, we should become distracted in our work in the name of remembrance of Krishna. Either we do our work diligently for the purpose of purpose of serving Krishna. Now, Jeeva Goswami went to Vrindavan, went, sorry, went to Vara, Varanasi to learn Sanskrit. And years and years it takes to learn Sanskrit grammar intricacies. And he went and associated with Mayavadis over there because that they were the best teachers of Sanskrit grammar at that time. So for the purpose of serving Krishna, he learned po he learned Kavya, he learned Natya, he learned Vyakran. Now all that is quite technical and unless one absorbs oneself in it, one can't learn it. But his purpose was remembrance of Krishna. So by our sadhana bhakti, it is our purpose that becomes spiritualized. And then we can bring that purpose into various walks of our life. And gradually the conscious the remembrance of Krishna will become more and more. Okay? Thank you. Yes, Madhuri. There's a comment and a question. Yeah. So the comment first, and it also reflects my view. So this is from Manjula Kanta Hare Krishna Chaitanya Charan Prabhuti, Tandar Pranams, all glories to Shri Prabhupada. Prabhu, this is day three of your lectures, and I'm still sitting, mouth open, listening to your amazing lectures. It's difficult to ask questions when one is still trying to absorb the sudden clarity and vision with which you are reintroducing us to the glorious Bhagavad Gita. Your lectures are truly spiritual gems, and we are so blessed to get your association this week. Thank you for considering ISD as a place to share your realizations and provide Krishna Tata with deepest
Clapping, clapping can be for appreciation and clapping can be for conclusion also. <laughs> <laughs> that is open to interpretation. <laughs> yeah. And a second question by Gaurav Prabhu. He says, Hare Krishna Prabhu, beautiful sessions Prabhu. One question Prabhu. What are the characteristics of kids functional and foundational identity? And what are the recommendations to help them advance in that direction? Hare Krishna. What are the characteristics of, of kids, functional, foundational identity? Foundational identity or fundamental identity is the same for everyone. Everybody is a soul. But kids are function, functionally, they are children. And they will, as children, play, have fun. And then Prabhupada was a small child. He, he wanted a gun. And he was given one gun. He said, I want one, two guns. I want one for, gun for each hand. <laughs> and Prabhupada demanded that. Now, Prabhupada, of course, his devotion was that he also, as a child, wanted to do Rathyatra. So, we don't have to, uh, we, do, we definitely want to, them to be Krishna conscious. But Krishna consciousness is something just as adults also, different adults will be Krishna conscious in different ways, to different degrees, at different levels of seriousness. So I have why devotee is a, is a son of a Prabhupada, Prabhupada disciples. And he is quite an intelligent person. He said that, he's telling me, my, my most prominent childhood memory is my parents' dis disappointment that I was not the reincarnation of Prahlad Maharaj. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> now, <coughs> <coughs> children will be children. And some, some children may be souls who are already very spiritually evolved and they may be spontaneously attracted to Krishna. Some may not be. So we have to make sure that that, <clears throat> that as children, what they will naturally do, we facilitate them in that and facilitate them in Krishna Bhakti also. It's, uh, they will take it up at their, they, they, if, we tell them to, if we tell them to do something, that's, they will do it. But at the same time, we have to make sure that they don't feel forced by it. And see, there is love and there is expectation in love. So as, as parents, we love our children, naturally we have expectations from them. But our love should not be conditional to the fulfillment of the expectation. It's not that our children should not feel that if I don't become a devotee, my parents will not love me. It's natural if they do something which is important for us, the bond will be deeper. But it's not that the love should be conditional. It's whether our, our relationship with our children as parents, it is there whether we whether they become devotees or not. But naturally, if they become devotees, we'll be happier. So we'll have that expectation. So the important thing is, yeah, we have a, a spiritual responsibility that the children should also become elevated and liberated. But that's our spiritual responsibility cannot trump. Well, maybe I should not use the word trump. <laughs> <laughs> our spiritual responsibility cannot override their free will. When the Shastras say that, okay, one should not become a guru, one should not become a parent, one should not become a teacher, if one cannot liberate one's dependence. What does that mean? That simply means that one, as a, when they take that role, they should not take it simply as a privilege and position. It comes with responsibility. But then we will see, even in scripture, sometimes great gurus, their disciples may not become always faithful followers. Advaita Acharya's own son, in the Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Chaitanya said that he became a Mayavadi. Of course, his Mayavad was a special version of Mayavad. He thought that because Advaita Acharya called Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, so Advaita Acharya is greater than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is an avatar of Krishna, Advaita Acharya is also equal an avatar of Krishna, and therefore we should worship Advaita Acharya. So it is a confusion. But basically, uh, Krishna Das Kriya Goswami quite categorical in not including Adhacharya's son in the lineage of Vaishnavas. So now, is that a failure of Adhacharya? Well, you could say at one level, okay, son didn't become a devotee. But every soul has free will. So, at a functional level, what a parent should be doing for a ch children, we should be doing it functionally as parents. 
and at a fundamental level we are souls so we want to provide them facilities by which they will also come toward krishna so both that way we can integrate our roles also okay okay one last question and move on after that yeah so at this stage arjuna is feeling a very intense uh, emotion and yeah in practical life we don't have krishna to console us the question is how do you deal with these intense emotions and how do you forgive so that you can move on with your life forgive okay how do we deal with intense emotions and forgive so that we can move on in life yeah a lot depends on the kind of nature we have and the kind of relationships we have different people process emotions differently some people when they are upset i want to be alone right now hmm some people when they are upset they need someone to talk with hmm. so we have to find out now everybody needs someone to talk with but how immediately how how fundamentally in what format they need some people i want to do my thinking first and then i'll talk some people you know it's by talking that they actually can process their emotions better so we have to we need the relationships that will help us to do that we may not have krishna we don't have krishna directly accessible to us right now but we need to have some some friends around us with whom we can share our heart and that requires cultivation that means rather than it said that don't expect a friend like vidura be a friend like vidura so when we are in need we will need a friend like that but if we have not extended ourselves to others in their time of need then for us to expect that will be unrealistic and unreasonable so we all need friends and uh, if we don't get at a particular time it can be very disheartening very distressing so we have to the best we can prepare for such times is we extend ourselves to others when they need us and then even if that person doesn't reciprocate quite often that person will reciprocate if we have a good bond but even they don't reciprocate now krishna will see and krishna will send someone else in our lives with whom we can connect so we do need connection we have to help us process our emotions okay so let's complete the remaining verses quickly now <clears throat> now from here onward krishna talks about the indestructibility of the soul when he's talking about how the soul is uh, soul is like the core person and the body like the dress the body will get old but the soul will not get old and prabhupada writes here in the purport that the repetition is essential for assimilation the same thing is repeated in different ways Uh, that is assimilated so here krishna talks about the point in 2.23 in terms of verbs in 2.24 he talks in terms of nouns verbs mean nainam chinnanti shastrani the 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 so the soul cannot be cut and in 2.24 it is a noun achedyoyam so it's impenetrable so the same point but in different way it is conveyed so that the <clears throat> the essential message is taken forward now there are two words over here sarvagataha and achala which are often used by impersonalists to talk about the all pervasive nature of the soul sarvagataha is all the literal translation of sarvagata could be all pervading and achala is immovable but you have to understand that the bhagavad gita is not just a literal book it's a literary book literary means it's literature and literature has its own way of presenting things now uh, so if we could say literally if the soul is sarvagataha then krishna has already said in 2.13 they he knows min yatha de the soul is situated in the body the body is definitely not all pervading so and the soul is situated in the body how can the soul be all pervading so here sarvagata refers not so much to the all pervasiveness as the capacity for traveling everywhere sarvagata ga means not existence but capacity to go that's how prabhupada translated the soul can go to any abode and if you see this makes greater sense because the context is what that all of the body is destroyed but the soul is not destroyed and the point of that is that even if the soul goes to a place where the body can get destroyed the soul will continue to exist 
So for example, our body, if it goes to the sun planet, the sun as a solar uh, object, there our body will be destroyed, but the soul will not be destroyed. The Sarvagata makes much more sense as capable of going everywhere, not all pervading. Similarly, Achala, if the soul is literally an immovable, then how can transmigration happen? Isn't it? The soul is in one body and the soul leaves that body to go to another body. Tha Dehantara Praptir Krishna has said. The soul is literally immovable, then the soul cannot, uh, soul cannot go from one body to another at all. So the, here immovable means the essential point is that it is not materially affected. The soul cannot be moved by matter. Material forces cannot move it. So it is the soul moves by its own desires and the soul moves by its attachments. So this, the point of this con the point in this context is the soul is beyond matter. And then, let's complete this and I'll talk about it. Can you go ahead? So now, two point if you go to Krishna uses a Krishna again talks further about the soul, avyaktoyam achintyoyam. Now again, you cannot take little achintyo means that which is inconceivable. Well, if it is inconceivable, then why are we trying to understand it? Because it's, it's inconceivable. The point of inconceivable over here is that we cannot conceive it fully. We cannot understand it through, and so different achas give different meanings. Baldev Devashim Thakur say that achintyo means that it cannot be, if we rely only on pratyaksha pramana, we cannot even contemplate it. We have to use inference, anuman, and we have to refer, refer to shabda. So achintya means, chintan cannot be done on it very easily without shabda. Hmm? And without, with pratyaksha alone, we can't do it. And if you see again the context, avikaryo ya muchate tasma devam viditvainam nanu chuchitu marhasi. Therefore, do not lament. In many Indian uh, traditional funerals, uh, this series of verses from 25 to 30 are, ch and are recited and the idea is these are nanu shochito marhasi, nat nainam shochito marhasi, do not lament, do not lament, do not, these are called na shochitum verses, that do not lament, so <laughs> do not lament, so we will see, I will show you later that several verses have this as a chorus point. So now if you see when Krishna is saying therefore do not lament, so the idea is when Krishna is talking about achintya or avikarya or avyakta, why is he saying that? He is saying that, therefore do not lament. That means exactly what will happen to the soul, which destination it will go to, we cannot know that. But know that the soul is eternal, soul is indestructible, therefore do not lament. So when a loved one passes away, we cannot know where they have gone. But we know that they are indestructible, they have gone to some other world, and therefore we need not lament for it. Now after this Krishna talks about the alternative world, that is the materialistic world. And it's quite an intricate argument, it's very brief in 2-3 verses, but it's an intricate argument. I'll just mention it very briefly over here. The materialistic view is that there is no such thing as a soul, that matter only gives rise to consciousness and it stays for some time and after that it is destroyed. But if that were true, then nothing will be true. Now what do I mean by that? See, if materialism is true, nothing will be true. Say if, say, all of us are feeling hungry now and maybe some digestive enzymes are getting secreted in our, in our stomach. Now, if some enzymes are secreted in our stomach, are those enzymes rational or irrational? Well, they are just enzymes, isn't it? You know, there is no rationality or irrationality in those enzymes themselves. They are just a bodily function. So, there is a bodily function which indicates, okay, now you are hungry, you have to take some food. But there is no, you could say, semantic content, no content in terms of meaning for them. So similarly, what happens in our brain, now nowadays people are like, many materialists, they have pinned all their hope on the brain. <laughs> the brain will save us from God. The brain will save us from the soul. Consciousness comes from the soul. God, consciousness comes from the brain, God is just a product of people's brain wiring. That is the idea that they have. So some science, just like in the past, uh, the Egyptians, they had preserved the bodies as mummies. 
So some scientists have till now preserved the brain of Einstein. And they hope one day we will revive the brain and we'll have Einstein back. So they pinned the hope on the brain. Now ultimately what is the brain? What is happening when we are happy, when we are angry, when we are going through various emotions? Certain chemicals are secreted in the brain. So at a bodily level, we are, if, if we consider the evolutionary perspective, we exist for two purposes, survival and reproduction. So we don't, the, the animals are not concerned about truth and certainly not the nature of reality. They are concerned only about surviving and reproducing. If we were also simply animals, evolved, simply evolved animals, then our concern will also be only surviving and reproducing. So we, as our brain, everything that we perceive in the brain, it is simply for surviving or reproducing. So what is true and what is false? What is metaphysically true, what is metaphysically false? The brain is not designed for that, you could say. Because just as a particular fluid coming in the belly doesn't mean anything, a particular fluid coming in the brain doesn't mean anything. It is just true or false itself has no meaning. Things are the way they are. This is dangerous, this is safe, this is enjoyable, this is not enjoyable. But true or false will have no meaning because the brain is simply functioning for surviving and reproducing. So materialism, actually, this is a I have an elaborate seminar and if you don't understand, don't bother about it, no? <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, materialism sabotages the search for truth. Because in, in the materialistic worldview, the brain is not designed to search for truth. The brain is designed only for survival and reproduction. And therefore, materialism undercuts cuts all philosophies, including the philosophy of materialism. So nobody can know any truth. So an atheist may say there is no God. You know, that ultimately the brain is the only brain is the only reality. Okay, if the brain, if everything that we believe, everything that we think is a product of the brain only, then God, the belief in God is a production of the brain. Disbelief in a God is also a product of brain. And something exists beyond matter is a product of the brain. Only matter exists is also a product of the brain. So how can you ever know whether any belief is true or false? You just can't know it. That's why a philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer says, materialism is the philosophy of the philosopher who has forgotten himself. You just leave yourself out completely. There's no concept of the soul, certainly in materialism, but there is no concept of consciousness as a, as a independent agent. Because we are all just biologically programmed machines. So materialism is a very detrimental philosophy. Because the, in materialism the idea is that people think, oh religion has so many rules and regulations. Materialism is free, just enjoy. But actually materialism is the most binding. Because materialism says that you, are, you have no free will. You are just product of whatever chemicals are secreted in the brain. Whatever urges are there, whatever is the product of your neuro neurochemical programming. That's how you function. And Einstein himself was very disturbed by this. He said that if we accept the materialistic worldview, then the Nazis who killed between 6 to 12 million Jews, they were just acting according to their brain programming. So they cannot be blamed for that. Now, none of us function like that. See, nobody functions like a materialist. If you take materialism to its foundational meaning, say, hey, if suddenly I come next to you and I slap you, he says, why do you slap me? Why did you slap me? Says, My brain programming told me. <laughs> okay, you will not accept that as a valid reason. And he will slap me back. He says, why did you slap me? My brain programming told me. <laughs> see, see, when we interact with each other, we treat each other as responsible human beings who are capable of, who are responsible for our actions. The whole system of justice is based on human accountability. So if we have no free will, if we are just biological machines, then justice will collapse, accountability will collapse, relationships will collapse. So materialism, nobody can live as a responsible human being if they accept, take materialism to its total conclusions. So Krishna rejects materialism and then he goes on. Can you go to 2.29? 
And this is the amazing verse. Hmm? <laughs> so let's let's quickly recite it. Ascharyavat pashyati kashchidenam, ascharyavat vadati tathai vachanya, ascharyavat chaina manya shunoti, shutvapya nam vedana chaiva kashchet. So people who think about the soul, the materialists think, how can you believe in something like a soul? And the spiritualists say, how can you live without understanding a soul? For both of them, each other are amazing. You know, just, it just doesn't make sense, the worldview. Uh, Krishna is saying some people just don't get it. No matter how much they hear about it, they speak about it, they, uh, they, some people, they see, they realize the soul and they understand it's amazing. So Krishna's conclusion in this verse is, again you see, Natvam Shochitumar Hasi. The soul is eternal, the body is destructible, the soul will never destroy Arjuna, therefore do not lament. So this is the section, the first section 2.11 to 30, where Arjun, con where Krishna concludes that Arjun, that because the soul is eternal, do not lament. So one of Arjuna's reason was that, oh, there is so much, we will all suffer if our relatives die. Krishna answers, no. You, you did not lament because the soul is eternal, the soul is going to continue to exist. In the next section, Krishna combines this and talks about how we can rise to spiritual level of consciousness. So we won't recite verses over there, but just I'll make two points from the next section. Uh, the next section, Krishna talks about that you have to do your the dharma and by that you will attain heavens. And then he says, actually if you do not attain heaven, you will get akirti, you will get infamy in this world. People in this world will say that you are ignorant, that you are deluded, that you are cowardly and that will cause you great distress. So it's interesting, Krishna says that sambhavita sucha akirti marana for some for, for a person who has been honoured, dishonour is worse than death. So here, I'll just make one point and then we'll conclude that there are there is pride and there is honor. The two are not necessarily the same thing. We could put it as maybe the word pride nowadays has a positive connotation. Like say you have hotel pride. Now we could use the word arrogance to be more clear. I have not seen anywhere a hotel arrogance, isn't it? So arrogance means you know, a person is too full of themselves. The word pride means it, it can have a negative meaning, it can have a positive meaning. You should have some self-respect, you should have some pride. So when Krishna is telling here, for one who has been honoured, dishonour is worse than death, he is not talking about, oh you should be arrogant. He is saying honour in the sense of, you should function honourably. Function in an honourable way. So a sense of honour is what enables us to act honourably. The Prabhupada writes in any session, in letter to his disciple, who has stopped practising his initiation vows, Prabhupada says that, you made these vows in front of the deities, in front of the spiritual master, in front of the Vaishnavas. Don't you have a sense of honour? How can you give up these vows? So a sense of honour is required. That's what enables us to function honourably. You know, in many in traditional culture, it is said that a person's worth is as much as the worth of their word. If they make a word, they will stick to that word. So that's idea. That's the word of honour. So honour is en honour is something which enables us to act honourably. In this world, there are temptations which everybody has. And how, how will we ensure that the temptations don't uh, drag a person away? That is by instilling a sense of honour within them. All of us, we could say that, you know, we are like, uh, in one sense, our body and mind, we are all souls who have come from lower species. Of course, some of you may have come from higher planets. I have come from a lower species, you can say. But all of us, or most of us, we can say we have come from the animal species. So our body and mind is still, you say, it's like a, it's like a, maybe it's like a monkey. And we have human intelligence which we tend to abuse for doing terrible things. See, a, 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 a lion will simply catch a prey and devour it. But a human being, if they want to hurt someone, the human being can torture. Like Mugrari half killing the animal. So we can actually cause more pain than what is necessary to each other. So we could say that we are we are like monkeys with snakes inside us. We are like a monkey with many snakes inside us. 
and these snakes can bite and hurt and kill. Okay, they can cause enormous pain. So it's not just other people are like that. Every one of us is like that. But when somebody has a sense of honor, then we don't have to negotiate with all the snakes inside them. Okay, you said you will do it, you will do it. All of those snakes will impel you to think of this, think of that, do this, but no. So to the extent, see, trust is the basic, basic requirement for relationships. If there is no trust, then no transaction can also happen. It's like say when online, online, online sell, selling and everything started, say eBay and something like that was there. So now it could be very easy that for a for a buyer to sell a to send a bounce check, and for a seller to give us useless product. Now who is going to litigate and do all those things to try to correct it? But because there was trust, a trustworthy behavior. Now online finance has become a big thing. So there is a sense of honor that is vital for functioning in society. If people don't have a sense of honor, then it becomes very, very difficult to work with them. So, and Krishna talks about a sense of honor. For one who has been honored, dishonor is worse than death. He's talking not in the sense of arrogance. He's the sense of, talking in the sense of being honorable. So, O oh Arjuna, you have been honored. And as an honorable Kshatriya, you cannot run away from war. And even if that is not what you are thinking, that is what the people will think. And therefore, you should not leave this war field. You should fight. And Krishna concludes in 2.37. Can you just go there to quickly? 2.37. So this whole section is, Krishna, you understand you are the soul. And because you are the soul, therefore, you fight. The smart 2.37, hato va praps, you can recite this first quickly. Hato va prapsesi swargam jitva va bhoksha se mahim tasma duttishta kaunteya yuddhaya krita nishchaya. So, the same two options that Krishna, Arjuna has rejected in 2.8, Krishna is presenting in 2.37. Arjuna has said that whether I gain prosperity in this world or heaven, I will not be satisfied. But Krishna has given him the knowledge of the soul and he said, from the spiritual perspective, you are not killing anyone. They all have to die by their own karma and they will continue to exist. Krishna has not yet introduced the concept of karma, which we will talk about later. But you cannot avoid their death because death is unavoidable. That is, that is sure to happen. But if you don't do your duty, you will get bad karma by that. If you do your duty, whether you win or you lose, you gain. If you win, you get the kingdom of this earth. If you lose, you get heaven. And in both ways, you will be benefited. So, this point concludes the section, Yuddhaya Krita Nishchaya. Therefore, arise and fight. So the knowledge of the soul is given so that Arjun will become rooted in his sense of duty. And <clears throat> now how this, this subject will be taken to a higher level, we'll discuss in our next session, which will be tomorrow evening. Quickly summarize. I spoke on the topic of the second chapter. We talked about three broad sections. First is Arjuna's uh, decision not to fight till he's enlightened. So Arjuna is crying publicly, indicating that a trauma that he was in, he was a trained warrior, uh, expert at concealing pain, but he was in such trauma that he was crying. And then he, Krishna spoke first at his level. Don't just give in to weakness. Arjuna said, this is not weakness. So then he got confused and he said, I want to know what is dharma. So that is a central question of the Bhagavad Gita. What is the sense of orientation for us in our life? How are we meant to act in our lives? And that's what the Bhagavad Gita will answer. And Krishna smiles at the end of the first section, not because Arjuna is unhappy, but because Arjuna is accepted. He's come out of denial of his confusion and acknowledges confusion and is seeking enlightenment. And Krishna speaks, talking about the body and the soul. And he begins by telling that our knowledge should be reflected in our actions and our emotions. And Arjuna is not doing that. Then we talked elaborately about the soul. Primarily, I talked about the difference between the, the Christian conception of the soul and the Gita's conception. That the soul is not metaphorical, it is metaphysical. And words are like handles, concepts are like the suitcase. So, we don't, can't just go by words, we have to see what concept they are, they are referring to in people's minds. 
And although the Bhagavad Gita talks about a radical dualism, that there are two realities, matter and spirit, but both of them are integrated and functional. The functional identity is not rejected, but is, is harmonized with our fundamental identity. And, and I talk about how materialism actually sabotages the squared quest for truth, because materialism leaves us with no cognitive capacity to pursue truth. All our cognitive capacity is simply for existing and reproducing. And lastly, I talked about the concept of honor, that honor is not same as arrogance. We are all like monkeys with many snakes inside us. But the sense of honor makes sure that we can be trusted. Okay. So ha having a sense of honor is vital for being responsible in life. And Krishna is asking Arjuna to be responsible. And with the knowledge of the soul, he says that whether you win or you lose, you will gain either this earth or the heavens. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. We'll talk personally. Shrimad Bhagavad Gita ki, Shri Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vindaki, Gaur Premanandi.